welcome to West Country Wanderings and a big welcome to Canal Update number 10. Yay, here we go again. I'm back today on the Thames and Severn Canal. I'm here in the village of Chalford, just a few miles to the east of the town of Strouds in the southern part of the Cotswolds. And of course, this is the Cotswolds Canal. The Cotswolds Canal Trust are striving to get this canal together with the Stroud Water Canal, which this canal meets in the town of Stroud, a place called Woolbridge, linked to the network again. All the activity at the moment is centered on the Stroud Water, connecting it to Saw. Obviously, we've seen that bridge at Stonehouse where Network Rail replaced that. All that activity has already happened. Things have slowed up at the Stroud Water end. There's lots of playing, lots of things going on behind the scenes, but I've got nothing visually or verbally to tell you about at this stage. There will be lots more happening at that end of things. So for today, I've got two things for you in this update, and there is a proper update later on in the video, as I'll come on to explain. We're gonna have a walk from the village of Chalford in an easterly direction towards the Daneway Inn. Now, if you're familiar with the Thames and Seven Acronauts, you'll know the significance of the Daneway Inn. And probably in update, 11 i'll be going on to cover the sapperton tunnel i'm sure lots of you'll be waiting for that i'm certainly am waiting to cover that i won't be doing that today but what i will be doing today i'll be stopping en route at the various locks wharfs keys and telling you a little bit about the history of the thames and seven canal as we go on eastwards the other thing i've got in store for you today is we're going to have a trip to the far end of the thames and seven canal at inglesham in wiltshire where it, of course, meets the River Thames. And the reason that's exciting is the lock there has been completely restored. I'm really excited about it. I haven't visited it yet. I'm recording this bit before I've gone to, to Inglesham. And for the first time ever, that lock is going to be open to the general public. I can't wait to show you that. So before we do that, why not join me on this wander here along the Thames and Severn Canal towards the Daneway Inn. Now, before we set off along the towpath, which is just in front of me. Just wanted to show you this. This is really significant, an important part of the canal history as well, but it predates the canal. And this is the Belvedere Mill. And the reason this was sited here, indeed many of the mills sited along here, along the, what's called the Golden Valley, is of course the River Froome. And that lies just in the valley below there. And there are many, many mills. Of course, they're all woolen mills on the back of sheep which you often see, of course, around the Cotswolds. And that's what made this part of the world really, really wealthy. You can also see some cogs there which have been restored and they were taken from the mill. It's no longer used as a mill. It's just light industrial purposes. So we just left the where I did that introduction to Canal Update Part 10 bit sad at this point because the canal's been diverted into a culvert. It was part of a road widening scheme. They also got rid of the original canal bridge shortly and uh, replaced it with some uh, ugly structure, which uh, I won't uh, bother, even bother you showing, but if I've got a, a photo of the original canal bridge, I'll put that in around about now. But yeah, we're going to continue across here and make our way across this busy A419 Stroud to Sirencester Road. And then we should be in the Golden Valley proper where things should quieten down. We'll move away from this very busy road. So behind me here is yet another mill. This is Halliday's Mill. We're going to come on to our first lock in a minute, Bell's Lock, or the remains of. But this is now used as an art gallery, just to include a photograph of the, the signs just on the road bit there. It's our busy road again. So we're going to say goodbye to that road now. So it should get a lot quieter, hopefully. Now this is the former site of Bell's Lock and you can actually appreciate, I'll do some clips, there is a very, very high stone wall there. So this was quite a significant engineering challenge for the builders of the Thames and Severn Canal. Near to here were two inns, the Bell Inn and the Red Lion Inn. The Bell Inn closed quite some time ago. Sadly, the Red Lion Inn closed, I think about a year or so ago here in the village of Chalford. And of course, both those inns were really important for not only for the navvymen that were constructing this magnificent canal, but also for the people, that were the bargemen that were using the canal, moving freight up and down along it. The other thing I forgot to mention about Halliday's Mill, just check my notes there, was that after it closed in the 19th century, and before its current status as a, an art gallery, it was also used for art. In fact, it was the center of Gloucestershire's arts and crafts movement. 
The other thing to mention at this point is we will be climbing, we will be coming to the summit of Dameway before the canal enters that magnificent Sapperton Tunnel. So we'll be climbing all the way today, hence the number of locks along the route along this Thames and Severn Canal. So this is the site of Red Lion Lock. That's oh, the remains of, well, not the remains of the bridge, it's a magnificent bridge. It's the only one of its type on the Thames and Severn Canal. I don't know why it was constructed in that manner. Beautiful little bridge, sadly overgrown since I was last here doing a little bit on Chelford or on one of my previous updates. I'll see if I can find a photograph of what it looked like that time. I did a black and white image of it, but it's become rather overgrown this time of the year. This is the lock bed, if you like, the walls and the basin of the lock just down here. There are no gates remaining at this point, but this red lion lock was significant in a number of ways. And I'll come on to explain what those ways were in a bit. Red Lion Lock was interesting in a number of ways I'll go on to explain and um, one of the connections to it is this stone wall on the edge of the towpath before the canal there. You wouldn't think it was a canal, it's completely dried up, obviously we've had lots of dry weather. Now this stone wall wasn't just coincidence or just for the convenience of the people going on the towpath. It was here because it was a little wharf here and there is a curve in the canal here. There's also a curve in the GW Railway at this point as well between Stroud and Swindon. And the reason for that, at this location, was a mill called either Inner's, Innell's Mill or Seville's Mill. And the reason this little wharf needed to be here was to provide coal carried along the canal for the machinery inside, or to power the machinery inside the mill. Now, the, one of the other reasons that the Red Lion Lock was so important is it provided or enabled access to what was known as the Black Gutter. Now, you probably think that's a bit strange. I thought it as well when I read about it. But what the Black Gutter was, was a series of springs, in fact, a spring line. And of course, canals, what they most need, most of all, apart from uh, paying customers to carry freight on them, is water, plenty of water supply. And as we'll come on our journey further east, we'll see that was an increasingly rare commodity and we had lots of problems with water draining away. But getting to the black gutter enabled this section, at least around the Chalford area, to have water in the canal to get the barges through it. Now, the other interesting thing to note, and sadly because it's overgrown, I can't actually get to see it, is on that bridge at Red Lion Lock is a little keystone and it's marked close ENGR, obviously meaning engineer, 1785 I think it was I'll check that and put that in now. Now Josiah Close was the head carpenter on the TNS during its construction. Carpenter probably think it's kind of a lowly thing but actually he helped in a number of the major construction projects to get this to gain its height from this point here to where we're going to go to at Daneway. In actual fact Close wasn't the only engineer to have his name inscribed in the canal here. One Herbert Stansfield also did, 4th of December 1784, there's an inscription inside the lock. Now I'm not going to go and scrabble down in the mud to try and find that, but apparently somewhere, well not apparently, there is a, an inscription. If I can find that on an old photograph, I'll insert it around about now, but I don't think I have that. But yes, his name is also inscribed there and he was one of the major engineers on the TNS. So behind me here is the remains of Golden Valley Lock. The three locks combined that we've seen so far, namely Bell, Red Lion and this one, have given the canal a climb of some 26 feet increase in height since the start of our walk. Now a couple of things to note here is that there is a bridge here, or rather there was, there was an original TNS bridge, only the butments remain. I'll just do some clips of that either side. And also, uh, there was a, they put in a, a new horrible concrete design for the road above it. Also here was the Clothier's Arms. Now that again was a strategic <laughs> first crunching point for the, uh, the bargemen and also the people building the navvies, building this uh, canal back in the 18th century. So yeah, you can see, I'll just see what clips I can get. It's a bit overgrown and I'm just standing in the canal bed. It, it's dry at this point, but obviously there's water in it just behind there. Now, through the trees behind me lies the remains of Chalford Waterworks. These have magnificent curved iron framed windows. It's an absolute beauty if you're interested in industrial archaeology at all, like I am. Not just canals and railways, but also things like mills and that. This is a, the wonder, obviously, it's no longer used as a water treatment 
works, but it's wonderful that it's now been preserved. And also through the trees is what is a remains of the fantastic Ashmead's Mill. It was demolished in 1903, but the small cottage here, just on the other side of those fields, with all that remains of it, used to process silk. And when the woolen industry went into a bit of a decline, a lot of the mill owners diversified into processing silk in this part of the Cotswolds. Now down here we have one of these magnificent milestone posts Woolbridge 5, Inglesham 23 and 3 quarters and of course Inglesham is where we're going to be later on in today's video on Canal Update 10 on the TNS. Has actually got, uh, there's it says the Valley Works opposite and it gives you an indication about that and it opened in 1894 the Charlford Water Works and it was later supplied softened water from wells to the mills in the valleys by steam and later to the public by electricity and then it says that the waterworks closed in 1974. So we've just come through quite a straight wooded section, very, very pleasant walking. It had Wesley Woods on one side and Old Hill Woods on the other. We've now come to a stop here at another lock. In fact, this one actually isn't marked on the OS map. I don't know why, because it is quite significantly important. It goes under two names, either Bolting's Lock or Baker's Mill Lower Lock or Lower Lock. Baker's Mill, which everyone takes your, your fancy. We'll have a closer look in a second because it's really interesting. Now this is one of the ones that when Gloucestershire County Council took over the TNS Trust at the beginning of the 20th century, some 120 odd years ago now, they lined it with concrete to try and prevent continuous water leakage at this section of the Thames and Severn Canal. But it was also used for another purpose as I'll explain in a minute. But yeah, you can just see the lock down here. I'll just do a close-up. There's a little bit of a tail to this one. I was at the Gloucestershire Warwickshire Railway a few weeks ago at Broadway in Worcestershire. And I got talking to one of the volunteers. I don't normally talk to, to people because I find it really difficult, as you probably know from watching my channel. But uh, he asked me if I was getting some good shots of the scene train. In fact, it was my 200th video, so I was feeling quite elated with that when I was doing that. And he asked me what I was doing. I explained about West Country Wanderings. And one of these things he said to look for when I said I was doing canal videos was this, or is it this one? Now, this is where it gets a little bit confusing because checking my notes, this lock used to be known as the Conk, C-O-N-K, bit of a strange name, isn't it? And after it was concreted and the TNS closed for transportation, local people used to use it for swimming. Now, the gentleman I met at the GWSR went on to explain that also it was used by army personnel from nearby Aston Down. Now, Aston Down's just a bit further up there, just alongside that noisy A419. It's now used for gliding. It was used a lot during the Second World War. Now, I'm not sure if the lock he meant was this one, as it mentions in the, the guidebook, or one a little bit further along. So we'll just have to, to wait and see on that. But it was known as the, the Kong either way. And I do believe this one was used as a swimming pool because you can see it has that closed off texture to it. But uh, that obviously hasn't been used for that purpose for, 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 for many, many years. We've now arrived at Baker's Mill Upper Lock. The bridge, which has been a bit modified, but within tasteful keeping of the TNS style, thankfully, and like the one we saw earlier on next to the former Clothier Arms. This carries the road between Chalford, so Chalford's obviously ended a bit further down there, to the village of, sorry, the town, the village, village of Chalford, Chalford, to the village of Frampton Mansell, which lies about a half mile in that direction, so it carries over the TNS. Obviously that had to be constructed when this TNS canal was built. We're going to have a closer look because it really looks interesting because I think I can see, I haven't got closer to it as yet, remains of some of the lock gates, although there isn't a lot to see, but it is, you can see some bits of timbers lying in the former canal bed here on the TNS.
Now after Baker's Mill Upper Lock, the canal widens out and there was a small wharf here to serve Oak Ridge Silk Mill. Something else interesting, well there is remains, well not remains, it's now a house of Oak Ridge Mill. I can't show you that because it's a now private property. But just off to the off side of that is a reservoir. In fact, the TNS bought land here to build this substantial reservoir to provide water for this section of the Thames and Severn Canal. This point here is magnificent. You get the sense here of the engineering that it took and the skill of the planners to choose this route. We've climbed, I think, something like 100 feet now from Chalford through all those locks. We've still got some more locks to go before we get to the Daneway Basin and the Inn, of course. But here, it's just absolutely magnificent. It's like you're gone back in time there. Are no other buildings. The only thing you can see there is a, a small electricity pole. Apart from that, you could be back here in the 18th century when the TNS had been built. Long way from the roads. The railway is still here. Uh, I haven't heard a train yet, but it, there has been quite a few because uh, it is quite a busy line. But what, between trains, you have the place yourself. Obviously, the Thames and Seven Canal here is. Very overgrown, as you can see, but it, wouldn't it be fantastic to get this completely restored on this section here? Imagining beautifully painted narrowboats going through here. It'll be truly something very special. So this is Puck's Mill Lower Lock. And again, like the one we saw earlier at uh, Baker's Mill Lock, or Bolting's Lock, this one was also locked off for swimming purposes. I'm actually standing on the concrete section that was infilled to make this a swimming pool here. But again, a beautiful location here, really, really quiet. So I've got this tree to support me because it is a bit of a drop down that way, not so much on that side. So obviously being very, very careful, but the concrete structure is very, very sound here, but I certainly wouldn't want to go any further in either direction because I'd probably end up getting stuck. But uh, fantastic spot here on the Thames and Severn Canal. Now we have this curious shaped building alongside the canal. It's not one of the TNS roundhouses, but it's just beautiful. I'm not sure if it was six-sided hexagonal, whether it's flat on the opposite side, but it's certainly presenting to us a three-sided, three-cornered house on this side, but perhaps presumably it's flat on the other side, but uh, I don't think about this because it's not mentioned in my uh, notebooks or guidebooks. So if anybody has any more information on this building, whether it's to do with the TNS or predates it or to do with the mill, please let me know in the usual way below. Thanks. We've now arrived at Puck Mill Upper Lock. In fact, Puck Mill used to be here. It's now Puck Mill House. It used to be a four-storey mill house. It was actually largely demolished in 1865, but the remains have now been modernised, but it's still a very aesthetically pleasing building, but of course now it's private. So that's the remains of the lock down there. So now we've reached the location of Whitehall Lower Lock. In fact, there's a cottage behind me. This is the last dwelling place between here and Daneway, which is about a mile just on further east of here. It's really difficult to film Whitehall Lower Lock. There is a fencing here and it is private. Well, it was a private bridge, certainly. It's not the old original TNS bridge to show you here. And the canal here is very, very narrow, much narrower than we've seen on other sections. It's also quite a steep drop just down there, but I can't really get a shot of it because of the vegetation as well. Sorry about that. But we're going to continue our journey further east towards Daneway. Now at this point, the canal makes a sharp turn to the right, goes around in an arc. And the reason, of course, it does that is because it's following the contours. Though we have been gaining height steadily since we left the village of Chalford, it needs to maintain that to avoid any additional locks if it continued off in that direction. And of course, it's making then towards Daneway Basin and the Sapperton Tunnel. Now behind me, just somewhere there, 
is Whitehall Bridge. Now this is really important in terms of Thames and Severn Canal history because it was a demarcation zone if you like. The section to the east of Whitehall Bridge was closed as early as 1927 but the section going west from here back to Warbridge and Stroud didn't actually close until 1933. So it was a really, really important point to, to the, the navigation. And of course, parts of the Stroud Water Canal continued to service coal into the mills in the Stroud Valley, down from Saw Junction, until just before, or sometimes some people indicate it was just after, around 1947, the towards the middle of, or just the end after, the Second World War. The point to note here, just after you pass underneath Whitehall Bridge, you then enter Sickeridge Wood, and Sapperton Valley. In fact, there is Sapperton Woods to the right of the canal at this point as well, both maintained by the Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust, and it's an absolute wildlife haven. I've been here a few times now, and it's just a place to really, really absorb wildlife. So we've now reached Whitehall Upper Lock. In fact, this is the first in a sequence of seven locks in very short succession. We're just half a mile between here and Daneway now. And Daneway, of course, is the summit of the Thames and Severn Canal. We've been climbing all the way since, there's a fly around me, all the way since we left the village of Chalford. Been a beautiful walk here, really enjoy it. So I'll just do these in quick succession, just show you each one. So yeah, this is uh, Whitehall Upper. So we now come to Bathurst Meadow Lock, named after the nearby Sirencester Park, Lord Bathurst, of course, who owns it. And generations, obviously, still do. Actually this is the steepest section of the lock in terms of the, the height of this lock or the, the depth of the of the lock here. Really incredible piece of engineering. I'll do some clips from this bridge. And of course here as we saw one of the uh, the white hall locks we've swapped over again with the towpath. We've just got uh, f I think it's five, I think my maths okay, five, five locks to go after this one. The other thing to note about these locks is uh, when they fell into disrepair is that uh, they were actually built originally for the seven, sorry, the, the Thames, uh, Thames barges. And uh, they were built in terms of the length of them. They needed to be 90 feet in terms of the length of the depth, or sorry, the length of the overall, the lock basin. And when it started to be run down, after we saw that demarcation line by that bridge, the seven troughs, which then used the TNS because this section was then closed after 1927. The Thames barges could never could no longer get here from the River Thames and so the freight was then being carried this by the, the, the seven troughs and that meant that maintenance was a bit easier because they didn't need to maintain the entire length of the lock basin because those troughs tend to be 70 foot in length or less. So we've now got to the impressive, with this, particularly with this tree growing out of the side of the uh, basin wall there. This is Sickeridge Wood Lower. Remember I said we were in Sickeridge Wood. We've actually got two more with a similar name coming up as we continue our journey to Daneway. But this is a beautiful lock here and it'd be fantastic to see this restored. Obviously would be a lot of work though, but yeah, absolutely terrific. And there's no prizes I'm afraid if you guessed that the name of this lock is Sickeridge Middle. And again, no prizes for guessing what the next one is going to be after that, again, because of Sigridge Wood here. Again, we have another fantastic tree growing out of the uh, lock basin wall there as well. Terrific. And now we have Sickeridge Upper. Again, <laughs> no surprise in that, but this one seems to be more dramatic. Beautiful brickwork here on the edge of the lock basin. You can hear that squawking noise. I think that's a peregrine up in the woods there, in the heart of Sickeridge Wood, here in Gloucestershire, alongside the Thames and Severn Canal. And here we have Daneway Basin Lock. There is one more lock, but I'm afraid it's no longer in existence, and that was Daneway Summit Lock. And that now forms the car park of the Daneway Inn. It was infilled quite a few years ago. I think it was the end of the 50s or early 60s. So this is the last lock I have to show you on our trip today from Chalford to the Daneway. One more thing to tell you though before I go and hand you over to Inglesham what's happening over there is that this was quite a wide basin and the barges and the troughs would lay up here waiting to get into the famous Sapperton Tunnel. 
So just to conclude, behind me here is where Daneway Summit Lock would have been. There is no lock here now, and this is the car park of the Daneway. I'll insert a shot of the Daneway in a second. It's quite a busy day, it's lunchtime now, lots of people around, I'll probably nip in for a quick drink, although I don't drink alcohol, it'll be a soft drink before I make my way back to the village of Charlford. I've really enjoyed my walk along this part of the Thames and Severn Canal, so it'd be wonderful to see this restored again. But now we're going to have a look at something that has been restored here on Canal Update number 10. So I'm gonna hand you over now to Inglesham in Wiltshire. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome back to the River Thames. We've got the beautiful River Thames here on this warm July Saturday, Saturday the 23rd of July. Today is a very, very special day here at Inglesham in Wiltshire. I've just crossed over from the Gloucestershire border. I've just driven through the lovely town of Lechlade and I've parked up next to Inglesham Church. Just going to include a little snippet of that in a bit. But the reason I'm here today on Canal Update 10 is to visit Inglesham Lock. Really excited about that. Going to make my way across that field shortly and then cross over the bridge and then into having a look at the lock and the roundhouse close up for the very first time. We've been able to do that as a member of the general public. So why not join me here continuing our journey along Canal Update 10 on the Thames and Seven at Inglesham in Wiltshire. So it's getting exciting now because we have that famous roundhouse and lockkeeper's cottage behind me. Just going to make my way over the bridge, over the River Thames, where the Thames joins the River Colne and also does the Thames and Severn Canal. So let's have a look. So this is a first to Inglesham, now walking on the bed of the former canal of the Thames and Severn. And it's obviously dry, we've had a very, very dry summer, obviously you came along here in winter. A bit boggy, but you wouldn't be able to do that now because we're on private land. This is not normally open to the public. This is a one-off event here today. Now this is uh, amazing, obviously, because we've had been to all those other places like Kempsford and Marston Maisie where access to the canal has been very very difficult we saw that roundhouse at Marston Maisie of course we've got another roundhouse here but to be able to walk on this section of the TNS here which is normally closed off is I feel quite privileged I feel privileged to be able to bring this to my viewers on my channel West Country Wanderings well before I continue to show you some more what's happening here today I'm just going to hand you over to Stonehouse in Gloucestershire to show you something exciting that's happening there, similar to what has been happened and ran to a great deal of success at Brimscombe Port. So see you back here at Inglesham in a bit. Now sorry to crash into our little trip to Inglesham. We just wanted to show you this. I'm actually in the town of Stonehouse at the moment and you're probably familiar with the town because of that bridge, the Ocean Bridge, which I covered Christmas New Year period, which has now of course been repaired. Here in the town, I'm close to the railway station in that direction and down there is a town centre. We're in a place called Queen's Road. Something exciting here is the Cotswold Canals Trust are about to open a shop. It's actually quite large. Now, a couple of updates not long ago, probably about a couple of months ago now, I covered their charity shop at Brimscombe. Brimscombe Port, obviously a site of lots of activity, but they're going to be opening a shop here which will be selling books, CDs and DVDs, also jigsaw puzzles. Now, it's not just there, it continues along here. And we have it here as well. And there's going to be more down here as well. In this one here so they're actually getting ready with all the the cds and dds racking so it goes back quite some way they're getting it ready to open probably over the next couple of weeks but like this poster says here they are looking for volunteers there is a telephone number i will put it on the screen now a gentleman called right 
Mike Richter. So I'll put his mobile phone number on the screen so you can see that. They're going to be open Wednesdays, Fridays and Saturdays from 10 till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And of course all the money that they raise from selling these donated items will go towards the Cotswold Canals Trust Fund to help restore the canal fully between Saw Junction and Inglesham. Now I'm going to take you back to Inglesham in Wiltshire. See you later. So welcome back from Stonehouse in Gloucestershire. Yeah, that's a really exciting project there. Hopefully that's going to be opening in the next two or three weeks. And if you do wish to volunteer for that, I'll put the details up on the screen again now, just in case you missed it. And I'll put in the, in the description as well. So yeah, it's fantastic here at Inglesham here today. Really enjoying this. Just as I say, I feel so privileged to be able to take part of this. We're going to walk along to the end of this canal section of the TNS to see what's been restored. And I say, it has been completely cleared of vegetation, completely cut back. We have a dry canal bed. And hopefully at one future point, we will see water back in this canal again. That'll be absolutely terrific to see, won't it? There is more of a restored section here than I uh, had originally first thought. It's quite a bit that they've actually done work on here, which is great to see all the hard-working volunteers for the Cotswood Canals Trust Eastern section. And I say, it tends to get forgotten because a lot of it is to do with Stroud District Council and where some, probably about 30 miles from Stroud in uh, Gloucestershire here. And this end of things here on the TNS tends to get forgotten. But this is fantastic here today. What I'm hoping to do in a bit after I've come to the end of this restored section of the TNS is I'm going to head back towards the lock. There are they are running some boat trips today from Lechlade here to Inglesham. I believe it was five pounds. I'm going to ch probably change my lens over and get some shots of the boats and then I'll take some photographs with a different lens of both the lock and the roundhouse and we'll see what the other things are going on the stalls here as well. So we've now come to the end of the line. This is the end of the restored section there. And beyond there, you can see the fence and it's completely overgrown. Obviously they will be doing work on that. I think the problem with that at the moment, they can't get stuck in to clear that because there are rights and ownership problems as we've seen many times on these Stradwater and TNS canal updates. You can't get close to it. That is why it's such a unique event today to be able to see this restored section here. And uh, yeah, so hopefully I don't know what the uh, solution is to these rights problems here on the TNS. If you are a volunteer for the Cotswold Canals Trust or any of the associated bodies to do with this, what are the plans to continue it along here I mean, in terms of ownership, in terms of rights of way? How, how is that going to be done? I don't know. If you had any answers to those questions, please drop me a line in the comments. Now I'm going to be launching shortly when I do my monthly vlog next week from Calm. We'll be looking at the Wiltshire and Berkshire Canal on that. We'll be launching West Country Wanderings Facebook group and there you'll be able to share. You can be able to talk to each other, not just to myself. You'll be able to share photographs of the canals as well. So I'll tell you more about that next week. Oh, we have a misty effect. <laughs> so I've just taken the lens cap off and it's just gone all misty. Sorry about that, it should clear shortly. Um, I've just gone to the, they got a little mobile cafe. Sorry, I forgot the lady's name. Really friendly. Pound for a cup of tea, so cheers. Mm. Needed that really hot day here. We're just going to amble on, see if I can see the um, boat coming in. Uh, I'm not sure if that's happening soon. The other thing to sell, I've just struck up a conversation with one of my subscribers, and he runs a lot of the volunteers at this end, the eastern end of the Cotswold Canals Trust. He was saying about the arrangements here. So all of this land is actually owned by the Cotswold Canals Trust at this end, although the roundhouse and the bridge is privately owned, as I understand it, but the lock is CCTV. 
and there is combined access across the, the bridge that we came across so it makes it a little bit trippy, tricky to, to get people in on a regular basis but I'm so grateful that uh, they've been able to get people here today. It's been a really good turnout and also it gives a chance to show off what they've done at the eastern section and also to get other various bodies local councils here as well and run up some much needed membership and hopefully some extra volunteers to help out on the canal so yeah all good stuff really good here at Inglesham Well, I hope you found that as thrilling as what I did here at Inglesham on the Thames and Severn to be actually able to walk along that section of the TNS that's been restored. Obviously, there's no water at the moment, but tremendous work has been done, including the restoration of that lock. It was good to meet some of the volunteers there too. 
As you know, I get anxious in public spaces, lots of people around. I'm really pleased that it's been well supported today though. People there, very, very friendly, made me feel welcome. A few people recognised me from my channel and saying keeping up the work. So I'll certainly try and keep doing that. I'm bringing canal update number 10 to a close now. So we're closing things off here at Inglesham. However, that won't be the end of things on my channel regarding Thames and Seven and Stroudwater. There will, of course, be an update 11. What's coming up in that, you ask? Well, a few things. First of all, we're going to continue our walk from the Daneway in the easterly direction. Of course, you know what that means. That means we will indeed be covering the Sapperton Tunnel. And in that video, I'll be giving you the history of the tunnel. I'll be including lots of historical photographs, ones I can share that aren't in copyright, with you on that so to explain what happened with the tunnel, how it was built, the disasters that happened in it, and what's going to happen with the future. So that's coming up in update number 11. Also, I'll be sharing with you what's happening at places like Brimscombe Port and some of the locks at Easington, because there's still been some developments down there. And I have any more news to bring you about what's happening on the Stroudwater and Thames and Seven Canals as I pick it up from people that have let me know or from the various websites and local newspapers. I'll include it then. Until next time on West Country Wanderings, take care of yourselves, look after yourselves, and I hope to see you on the channel again very, very soon. All the best for now. Goodbye.